to see the progress and the blessings that God's pouring out on you as a people. And it's always easy as a guest to differentiate churches that have found the favor and the will of God because you look around at the smiles and the worship and the interaction of people. And without a doubt, God's doing special things in Cabot. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. It's so nice to be with your pastor, Pastor and Sister Gaddy. What great people they are. It's a delight to get to know them. And I'm honored to be in the house of the Lord with them. Praise the Lord. Open your Bibles today, the book of Genesis. We'll begin reading out of Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. I've come to preach to you and those of you who have some promises and they're not yet fulfilled. Who have some promises from God and you're anxious and you're waiting. And you believe that the best is on the way. And that all God has given you is not all that God will give you. And you can't help yourself. You just believe. God's got some surprise up his sovereign sleeve and something wonderful is on the way. If that's you, say amen. In fact, the psalmist said in 27 and 13, I would have fainted. I would have quit. I would have walked away. But I believe. I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's you I come to preach to. That belief, the goodness of the Lord is coming. Genesis 5 and 1, follow along as I read. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Tell your neighbor, say, your appointment is greater than your disappointment. Now say it like you mean it. Say what's coming is better than what you've had. You may be seated. Genesis is a prerequisite for study of anyone who considers them to be a serious student of the Word of God. For it is within the book of beginnings, Genesis, that you learn the distinctiveness of the God you worship. You discover His power, His sovereignty, unique qualities regarding His identity, His plans, His ideas, and His dreams. There are concepts and principles that are established in Genesis. And most of our theological issues we enjoy today have their beginnings in that book of beginnings. Adoption, election, foreknowledge, substitution, tribulations, second coming, blood atonement, virgin birth. They all spring forth from the pages of this first book. Those concepts established principles that become guideposts and guidelines for us who live under the new covenant. Genesis begins thusly. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the very beginning, the earth without form and void. And when the designer of the universe gives his description of creation, it's just ten words. In the beginning, God created 
the heaven and the earth. And those ten words stand in all of their naked force, the opening salvo of Scripture. No attempt is made to water it down, to apologize to a skeptical age, or even to prove that God is. For the Holy Spirit deems certain truths to be self-evident. First and foremost, God is. And in one sublime statement, God sweeps aside atheism by asserting his existence. In the beginning, God. He denies polytheism ah, by declaring himself to be one. In the beginning, God. With no help, with no governor, with no secondary. In the beginning, God. And he rejects pantheism. He separates himself from matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He needed nothing outside of himself to create all that there is. For all that exists exploded out of the creative ability of the God you worship. There is no one like your God. The planet is without form and void. And darkness is upon the face of the deep. And yet it is about to become the platform on which God will stage a demonstration of the fact that not only is He good, He is also great. So God first deals with darkness. Light be. And instantly... Light was. Light appeared before there was a sun. Word first. Evidenced by the reality of light on the fourth day. But on the first day, God declared, let there be light. The skeptic would declare, it violates the creative process. How can you have light without a sun? You can if you're God. It also establishes a creative reality. You will always get a word first. And the authentication or the evidence, the proof of that word later. God speaks first. And the evidence of his word being spoken appears in our life at a later date. Some of you understand what I refer to. For God says you're healed, and yet the healing takes place a week, a month, or a year later. But the reality is God's word was still authentic and valid the moment it was spoken. I want someone to understand God will always give you a word and the promise will mature at a later date. It's a principle established in the creative account. Word first action later and God said it's good it's good and the light it reveals a chaos of tossing water a vast and shoreless sea and no land raises its head above the smothering mist uh, and the heaving waves and with words God put an instant end to that land appears an atmosphere is formed. And at once, those two oceans are separated with a far-flung permanent between. A place for the clouds to congregate, for the weather to have its way. And God said, it's good. Still those restless seas held authority over this empire and all the world and with mere words again. God puts an immediate end to this restless sea. Continents arise. Towering peaks appear. The land throws off the mantle of the sea. And it was good. And in the vast cold and emptiness that is space, stars appear. Orbits spin up. Planets are suspended on the sovereignty of his command and it was good next life began to appear upon the earth in countless varieties and forms and the seas swarmed with life 
and the sky was overtaken by winged animals, uh, creatures great and small. And it was good. Vegetation throws her blanket across vast segments of the earth. The green appears. Forests spring up everywhere. And it was good. Creatures great and small grazed the glens and roamed the vast forest of this pristine world. And it was good. Then God made man. And he created him in his own image and likeness. He purposed him to be inhabited by God's Spirit himself. A creature apart, able to think, to feel, to decide, to speak, to sing, to appreciate beauty, to control his environment, to rule the world, to worship his creator. And it was good. In fact, it was so good. God says, this is very good. This is very good. And, and God rested. Adam, the monarch of all he surveyed. Adam, all things are under his feet. Loved by God. Daily fellowship with God. It was good. Suddenly, one morning, God declares, it's not good. For Adam ruled the vast empire alone. And being alone is never good. The birds of the air had their companions. The foxes had mates to share their dens. The neutrons had their protons. And yet Adam roamed the world solitary. It was not good. That's what God said. Adam possessed relationship without fellowship. Adam walked with God alone by himself. And relationship with God alone is not enough. That's what God said. Knowing me alone is not good enough. There has to be another level. And God himself recognized in the perfection of his creative ability and work, what I have supplied is not enough. So a sleep comes over Adam and to work goes God again. You see, you were not meant to be alone. God recognized Adam needed more. And the simple truth is this. You need the fellowship of other people to worship your God. We're not complete worshiping alone. Staying home is not good enough. There's something about uh, the fulfillment of God's presence when we worship God in unity together. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Some things are meant to be shared. Adam's poverty was this, rich in relationship with God, but he had zero prospect of fellowship with another human being. So out of the sleep Adam is in, he awakens. And upon awakening from that dream, he saw a dream. Well, there she was. Perfection. Created by God for him specifically. And this intelligent man who commanded animals, who operated at a higher mental capacity than we do, who named every animal and who they responded to, this man stuttered and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Woman. And that's what we've called her ever since. Whoa, man, his counterpart, his help me. And suddenly everything is good. In fact, everything is exceedingly good. Extraordinarily good. Really good. And yet sin comes and shatters that goodness for it doesn't last long. And now 
suddenly you have fellowship with people but no relationship with God. Adam loses his relationship with God but not his interaction with man. You know, often life begins well but doesn't turn out the way we plan. Life doesn't always unfold the way we think it will. The beginning of God's plan Adam and Eve, they're more than a love story. It's more than a saga of positive events gone wrong. It is within the failure of Adam and Eve that we see the identity of God and His intentions for His highest creation. You see, we realize in the first family, things can begin well, but they do become catastrophic sometimes. Yet it is within that failure that we understand something about the God you and I worship. Why is it that when we sin, we run from God rather than to God? Adam! Adam! Where are you, Adam? Adam! The cool of the garden. His consistent relationship with the Lord. God is not rejecting him, but God walks through the garden saying, Adam! Adam! Where are you, Adam? Adam? Adam is in hiding, not God. Adam is running from God rather than running to God. Uh, and Adam very quickly points at Eve and says, It's her. And by the way, you gave her to me. She was your idea. Human nature hasn't changed much, has it? We're still pointing the finger at someone else. Adam, where art thou? Adam, does anyone in this room believe that God didn't know where Adam was? So why then would God ask that rhetorical question? Adam, where art thou? Adam, it was a message to Adam and to every individual in this house. God was speaking his voice so that Adam could reorient himself and find his God in the middle of his confusion. Adam, where art thou? God wasn't asking a question of which he had no answer. God was calling Adam's name so Adam could find security. But even in your darkest hour, when you've messed up, slipped, and made a mistake, you can still come home. Adam, where art thou, Adam? I'm right here, son. And by blaming Eve, Adam is subtly blaming God. How can I do any better? You set me up for failure. And God judges Adam. He judges Eve. And he judges the serpent which beguiled her. And everything we endure today is a result of the dysfunction of the first family. For within that first family, there is chaos and guilt and shame. But in the midst of that pain, God speaks a prophecy. In the middle of the judgment, God releases a promise. Have you ever been in chaos and in the middle of your confusion, you felt hope? God spoke a word. You heard a sermon that could shift the details. Something the woman will produce will bruise the head of the serpent. Something out of the woman will change everything. A prophecy in the storm. Things will get better. It's not over. It's not finished. It's not done. Something will shift the reality of your situation. It's the first messianic prophecy. A child's coming that will change everything. There's never been a baby before. There's never been a natural childbirth. Uh, faith with no point of reference. Believing when you have no experience with what you're being promised about, but holding on to God's Word. Some of you are in situations you've never seen anyone come out of, but can you have faith when you have no experience for what the promise really speaks of? And can you imagine the excitement at that inception of that initial pregnancy 
when Eve finally realizes there's something within me that has the potential to bring God's promise to pass. It's a conversation I can only imagine. The incriminations, the shame, the guilt that go along with being banished from God's Eden. I, it's your fault. It's your fault. You should have stood up for me. You shouldn't have talked to him. Can't you imagine the finger pointing and the guilt that tears apart that relationship then she tells him one day she doesn't feel good I'm feeling a little sick Adam says well if you hadn't have bitten that fruit we weren't ever sick he said why don't you take a day off while I till the field and fight the thorns and the pestilence and the plague and they come home with mosquito bites and irritating horse flies upset and irritable and the next morning she tells him again I just don't really feel well he's a little more irritable but hopefully he's wise enough to keep his mouth shut the second time around storms out the door without his breakfast because she just doesn't have the energy to do it today two days turn into seven and seven turns into 14 and 14 become 36 and he's fed up and somewhere in there about eight weeks into it she says honey do do I look fat? No husband should ever be asked that question. Ever. Because if we lie, we're in trouble with God. And if we tell the truth, we're in trouble with our spouse. What do you do? It's really no different than our families, is it? I can only imagine what happened when Eve, for the first time, felt life within her womb shift. When she knew this isn't a sickness. This isn't feeling weak. This isn't weight gain. There's something in me alive. Something in me is stirring in my womb. This is the promise from God. And she knew, my hope is tied up in my body. For God said, something in me would change my destiny. Something in me would make things right. It won't always be like this. The excitement only grew as the pregnancy was further advanced and Adam would lay his hand upon her belly and feel that child move and they knew everything's going to be different and the birth came and the pain and the childbirth but it was okay because they knew what those boys represented. Incidentally, there's a lot of theological debate that they're actually twins. Huh? That, that Esau huh? and Jacob are twins, or excuse me, not Esau and Jacob, Cain and Abel are twins. And there's a lot of debate that they're actually twins. And you say, why? Because the Bible never says Adam knew her, that they're just born. But it, it really doesn't matter if they are or if they're not. It doesn't matter exactly how it happens. Only that when Adam and Eve have those precious children, they raised them to be religious. They raised them to be worshipers. They trained them to, to honor God properly with sacrifice. And, and the day comes when Adam will let them worship on their own. And those sweet children, those kids that have grown up understanding the process of worship, when on their own in worship, anger follows as those children who have become men give their worship to God upon an altar anger which is never welcome in a place of worship finds residence and suddenly Abel the keeper of the sheep who brings his sacrifice beautiful and unblemished he's cared for it and prepared it for this day Cain the tiller of the ground has brought a beautiful sacrifice too, he's worked hard and yet his sacrifice doesn't fulfill the commandments of God why is it we insist God be satisfied with what we want to give rather than give God what he desires why is it that in our days we insist that God be happy with our forms and modes of worship or giving or lifestyle change when really we just need to make sure we're giving God what God desires? 
I, I don't want to give God what pleases me. I want to give God what pleases him. And jealousy explodes into violence. And suddenly we have a child who breathes no more. His blood stains the ground. And judgment comes again. And Eve has lost both boys. One to violence and one to wickedness in his heart. The fight, death, judgment, and the pain that follows is unbearable. The failure as a parent overwhelms her. They've raised them right. They've done their best to train them. And yet, sin came. And it shatters their life again. And the frustrations, who will bruise the head now? Who will bring restitution now? Where is her deliverance? She had dreams and expectations, but now they're gone. It hasn't turned out the way she thought. But I'll say it again. It's not over. You're sitting here today and your life, your job, your business, your ministry, your church hasn't turned out the way you thought it would, but the Spirit of God sent me on this Sunday morning to tell you it's not over. God's not finished. It's not done. Things are not turning out the way you thought. But God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. You're not where you thought you would be. It hasn't turned out the way you thought it would. Uh, but can I just tell you, we really don't have problems. We have a lot of luxuries of being spoiled. Our shoes don't fit right and the car's not right and we haven't put the pool in and the house isn't big enough. Huh? That's not trouble. Real trouble is when one son murders another son and you lose both sons. That's real trouble. And Adam and Eve are in real trouble. The pain that's invaded them emotionally, the rejection, the frustration, huh? the accusation, it's filling that family just as it would ours. And yet Genesis 4 and 25 is one of the most relevatory and pain-breaking scriptures in all of the Old Testament. For the scripture says this, And Adam knew his wife again. Adam came with his flirtatious behavior, his desire for intimacy. And yet that's the very thing that got them in the trouble they're in. It was through intimacy that a child comes. And it was that child who smote another child and the anger that resonates within that family. Because I understand human nature to know that when you're in pain, we typically close ourselves off. We shut ourselves down. You say, oh, not me, not me. Oh, yes, you, yes, you. In pain, someone says, well, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Who wants to hear that? We lose someone we care about and say someone says well trust in the Lord in all his ways and we fold ourselves and we close our hearts to love and, and, and intimacy and connection because we're angry and we're frustrated but the scriptures that Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth watch this there's a colon that means the next portion of the scripture will define what came before it look what Eve says for God, said she. Say that. Say, for God, said she, hath appointed me. Say it about yourself. Say, for God, hath appointed me. Now look at the word she said. Another seed. Another seed. Instead of Abel. You know what she's saying there? I thought Abel was the one to bruise the head of the adversary. I thought Abel was the guy. Uh, Cain took him, but God will give me another seed. I have an appointment for something that's greater than this disappointment. I, I have an appointment uh, for something that's more meaningful, that God, God's not finished with me. It's not over. Even the failure of my family, the crisis within our relationship, God's not done. For she believed the Word of God so completely that in the middle uh, of complete failure and chaos, she said, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. She said, it's not over. God's not finished. It's not 
done. I, I still believe there's something better coming my way because of God's promises. I want someone in Cabot to just hear it uh, deep in their soul. Uh, it's not finished. Uh, it's not over. Don't fold your heart in despondency. Don't stomp your foot in despair. The way Adam was trying to woo Eve is the same way the Holy Ghost is trying to woo some of you in this house, uh, telling you, I'm not finished in your marriage. I'm not finished in your family. I'm not finished with your kids. I'm not finished with your relationships. Relationships. Believe me, it's not over. For God said she. For God said she. For God said she. Someone in this house needs to encourage themselves in the Lord. You need to speak into your own spirit. God's fighting for me. It's not over. The best is yet to come. God's working for my good. All things work together. You need to speak into your own spirit. Remember when Adam ran and hid amongst the leaves, so too do we run and hide amongst the clutter of a modern life. And we hide behind uh, our feelings and our skepticisms and our fears and our worries. Uh, but I wonder, will anyone find uh, courage to believe that God's fighting for you, that it's not finished, that his word never fails? For God said she. You know, it's so hard to break into someone's pain huh? oh, with intimacy because they closed that door on relationship. Huh? Oh, that's why pain in a church will silence worship. That's why disappointment in the house of God will cause people who normally have their hands up to let them hang down. But I'm here to testify to a church. There is no situation without hope when God is in it. For all things are possible. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you've been. But would you let the Spirit of God love you out of where you are right now? The Spirit is here to seduce you and to release you from the frustrations that are your life. But you have to be willing to worship again. You got to be willing to love again. You got to be willing to pray again. You got to be willing to dance again and to sing again. There's something on the other side of the failure. It's not over. If you believe that, raise your hands with me right now. Eve is testifying to every person in this room. The entire time she was in despair, she knew something better was possible. The entire time she was in chaos and frustration, she knew the best is closer than I could ever believe. I pray today you can find the courage to believe God's not finished with you. What God has for you with Seth is not negated by the pain of Cain and Abel. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. For God hath appointed me, appointed me today. It's January 12th, 11th, the 11th. If you have a doctor's appointment on January 31st, do you have an appointment today on the 11th? You do. You have an appointment. You haven't arrived at the fulfillment of that appointment. But you have a date on the calendar. And some of you today have a divine date on God's calendar of destiny for breakthrough, for healing, for deliverance, for salvation, for freedom, for liberty. You're not there yet, but can you believe with me that God's got it on his calendar. Can you believe with me that there's a date coming when your children come home, when your marriage finds peace, uh, when there's renewal uh, within your spirit? Can, can you believe with me that the best is coming? For David said, I, I would have fainted, but I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have quit, uh, but I just believe deep in my spirit. There's a better day on the way. There's something better are coming for me. God's got a date. It won't always be like this. If you believe the best is coming, stand to your feet right now. Hallelujah. 
Genesis 5 and 1, that was the text. This is the book of the generations of Adam and the day that he created he them. Male and female created he them. Put it on the board for me if you would. Go to verse 3, Genesis 5. But pay attention to that first phrase of verse 1. In fact, say it with me. Say, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And Adam lived a hundred and what? Thirty years. A hundred and thirty years. And he begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. That's appropriate. Let's go back. Let's just read one and two now. You ready? This is the book of the generations of Adam and the day that God created him. In the likeness of God made he what? Him. Verse two, watch. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name in the day when they were created. Verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and did what? Begat a son in his likeness and called his name Seth. Now chapter 4 are filled with tragedy and violence and betrayal and jealousy and anger. Chapter 4 is filled with disappointment and despair and guilt and incrimination. And yet chapter 5 begins with a simple phrase. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God appointed the historian, the genealogist, to write the path of Adam's life, he said, start right here, chapter 5. This is the book. 130 years, I blessed them, and he begat a son named Seth. Well, what about Cain and Abel? That's chapter 4. And God says, nope, this is the book. Right here, it begins anew with my promise. Some of you are tormented by things, and they're not even in your book. You're frustrated by the chapter 4s. You're frustrated by the inconsistencies and the failures and the frustrations, and it's not even in your book. Others, the promise of God hasn't become manifest in your life yet. And you're still living in the uncertainty and the frustrations of chapter 4. But God wants to close the book today. Start you over with His purpose that will bruise the head of the serpent. And will dramatically change your life. Because it was through the lineage of Seth that Jesus Christ visited this world that our sins might be removed permanently. If Eve had closed herself in faith, if she would have folded her arms in despondency and resisted relationship, there would be no Seth and there would be no Jesus Christ. But a woman fought through her pain in faith. For God said she, has appointed me another seed. No matter the tragedy I go through, God's Word will always produce what He promised. I'm here to tell someone in the Spirit, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't fold your towel in despondency and quit this race. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep asking. Keep singing. Open yourself to the intimacy of God's Spirit today. And God will close a book. Start something new. Begin a new path. 130 years and the book was closed. You see, that's exactly what for us repentance and baptism become. When I repent of my sins and ask God to forgive me, instantly, not by my might, but by His holiness, I'm forgiven. The moment I ask in sincerity, God forgives my sins. When I'm baptized in the name of Jesus and immersed in water, my sins are washed away, never remembered again. The book's closed. The book's closed. And when I embrace the Spirit of God and His Spirit settles into my life, according to the book of Acts, a language overtakes me. Words I've never learned begin to flow out my mouth. 
I don't understand them. I'm not intended to. For if I understood them, I would manipulate them. I would force them. Because when I pray in my language, I, I pray about cars and houses and lands and people and opportunities and advantages. But according to Romans 8 and 26, I don't even know how to pray properly. For the scripture said, you don't know how to pray as ye ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession. The Spirit begins to pray for me. Fixing what I don't even know is broken. Healing what I don't know is wrong. No wonder God gives us a gift. Is it really so unusual that the God who spoke all things into existence would give you a speaking gift? For after all, it is by words at creation that all things were made. And it is by words that you pray that things that are not become what they should be. That's what the Spirit's for. Healing you. Praying for you. Developing you opening doors, closing doors, uh, uh, bringing promises, stopping curses. That's what the Spirit does. It's not spooky. It's not weird. It's not unusual. It's just the gift of God finding a voice in you. If you've never received the gift of the Spirit, you've never spoken in tongues, you're in a safe place. No one would be critical or uncomfortable as you begin to speak in the language of the Spirit in this church. In fact, many of us have received that experience and we only want you to receive with us. So here's what we're going to do. Because, you know, I, I almost forgot one of my most favorite parts of this story. 130 years and they had a kid named Seth. And then if you keep reading, it says that Adam lived 800 more years and begat sons and daughters. Any idea how many kids you can have in 800 years? But Eve, maligned by a lot of people, but a woman of faith who said, I believe God's word's going to come to pass. And my failure does not predict my future. It doesn't negate my promises. I still believe. And just in case it's not Seth, I'm having another baby. Just in case it's not that one, another baby, another baby, another baby. I'm just going to keep doing what I know to do to bring God's promise to pass. And some of you need to make that declaration today. I'm going to keep doing what I know to do to bring God's promises and deliverance into my life. I'm going to keep worshiping. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep dancing. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep singing. I'm going to keep being faithful. And God's going to do what God said he would do. So if you're here and you're ready to embrace God's presence right now and you're ready for God's Spirit to baptize you again, to be intimate with His presence again, if you've never received the Spirit, if you've received it many times, or perhaps you're here and you've spoken tongues once and it's been a while, I want everyone who believes the best is coming, that God's not finished, to hurry to this altar right now.